Hello, today we're going to talk about the equivalent point load, um, particularly how to find the equivalent point load for distributed force. So, it's easier to model point loads in equilibrium equations than it is to model distributed forces. So our first order of business when we find a distributed force uh, is to kind of transform that into a point load. Uh, and we want to replace the distributed loads with something that is uh, statically equivalent to that distributed force, uh, so it will cause the same kind of reactions. Uh, and <clears throat> when we find something, when we find a single point load that is statically equivalent to the original distributed load, that is called the equivalent point load for that distributed force. So we're looking for something, the important part here is it's statically equivalent, uh, a version of our point, of our distributed force. So, <clears throat> Going back to statically equivalent systems, um, two things are statically equivalent if they cause the same reactions. Uh, so imagine we've got a six meter long beam here, we've got a 200 pound man standing on it. Uh, he's gonna cause a 100 pound reaction force at either side. If we've got two children that are both 100 pounds and they're kind of evenly spaced on the beam, uh, they're gonna cause the same reaction. So these two sets of forces, the one force uh, of the 200 pound man or the two 100 pound ch children are statically equivalent to one another. So a distributed force you can think about, a distributed force is even further over, it'd be a third example, uh, and it'd be a bunch of very, very tiny children all lined up on the beam. So if we have all these little tiny children, we want to find the one big man, the one force uh, that would cause the same, the same reaction forces as all of those little tiny forces. So, to find the equivalent point load, uh, we're going to need to find each of the following. So with any force, we've got a magnitude, we've got a direction, and we've got a point of application. So over here in our diagram, I've got some distributed force. Uh, it's not even, so it gets stronger over on the one side, uh, and that's shown in the dotted lines. And then this single arrow is gonna be my example of the equivalent point loads. So There's a single point load, that is equivalent, statically equivalent to that distributed force. So <clears throat> the one thing that we have going for us uh, in statics, we really only deal with distributed forces that have a uniform direction, uh, and therefore the direction is kind of easy. So the direction of the distributed force, that uniform direction going down, is gonna match up with the direction of my uh, equivalent point load. So one down, I still need to find though, the magnitude and the point of application. So magnitude uh, is gonna be the variable FEQ, it's the magnitude of my equivalent point load. And in this case, uh, I only need to know one dimension, how far it is along this beam, um, and that's gonna be XEQ is my point of application. So to find the equivalent point load, uh, we need to find these two variables, FEQ and XEQ. And we have two options that we uh, can look at to do this. So we can calculate all of this via integration, so a calculus-based approach, uh, or we can calculate this via composite parts. So the composite parts method uh, is going to be uh, more of a geometry-based approach. Uh, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, calculus, you can find anything so long as you can find the equations and do the calculus. Uh, composite parts tends to be a little bit easier. You can look up some of these values in tables and you don't have to go through all the calculus yourself. So <clears throat> the magnitude of the equivalent point load is going to be equal to the area under the force function. Uh, and if you think about this, um, say I had more of a uniform distributed load. If I had some beam that weighed uh, five newtons per meter and it was two meters long, uh, to find that, I would multiply the five newtons per meter times two meters to find 10 newtons would be the overall uh, weight of my beam. Uh, so <clears throat> to find the area under a kind of continuously changing curve, uh, we, we're gonna take the integral under this curve. So the integral gets us the area under the curve. So <clears throat> the first thing we need to do though is find an equation describing the magnitude uh, of this surface force. So this distributed load, uh, finding the equation of this line right here. So say it was 
um, one newton per meter over here, and I had three newtons per meter over here, so it's going up. This appears to be a line, so my slope is going to be, if I go <clears throat> from one at zero to three at two meters, uh, I've got a slope of one, so it would be x plus my y-intercept is one. So my force function, in this case, if I go from one to three, is gonna be F equals X plus one newtons per meter. So once I have that force function, uh, next I'm gonna take the integral of this to find the, <clears throat> I'm gonna find the integral of this to find the magnitude. And I'm gonna take this with respect to the uh, distance, or X. So I go from x min to x max. In this case, it's going to be, I'm going to call this 0 over here. So 0 to 2 meters of f of x. That would be my, um, in my example, that was x plus 1 dx. So if I take that integral from 0 to 2, I should find my feq value. Next, we need to find the point of application. So now we found feq, we need to find xeq. So with this, we're going to multiply the force function by x and take the integral. So this is called the first area moment integral. Uh, and we're going to divide that by the magnitude of the equivalent point lows. So that's the FEQ value we just found. And that gives us this following equation. So it's almost the same except uh, we're going to x min to x max, f of x, that would be my x plus 1 for the example I had, times x. So rather than x plus 1, I'm taking the integral of x squared plus x, because that's the whole thing times x. Um, and I divide that by FEQ, that's the magnitude that I just found before, and that gives me my XEQ value. Uh, so you might wonder, where does this formula come from? Uh, well, really, we're just balancing the two moments. So if I multi multiply both sides by FEQ, I bring that over here, uh, it would be FEQ times XEQ, uh, force times distance, that's the moment of the equivalent point load, uh, is going to be equal to this integral I have on the top. And so f of x is going to be the force of any little piece of my distributed force times the distance x, so force times distance. I'm taking the integral of all those to sum up all those little moments. So all those little moments, the sum of all those, uh, has to be equal to the moment created by my equivalent point load. So I'm balancing the two moments here. To calculate this via composite parts, uh, I'm going to use two things that I know about the whole situation. So <clears throat> this is going to be more of a geometry-based solution uh, rather than calculus-based. So <clears throat> with my diagram, as I stated before, the magnitude of the equivalent point load will be the area under the force function. So the area under this force function is shown in kind of a, a pale red here, uh, and that is going to be uh, it's just a trapezoid, so if I can find the area of this trapezoid, I can find the equivalent point load. And the units will work out as well to be just a force, because remember, uh, this, this beam is something like so many newtons per meter. So newtons per meter times the width is going to be meters. It's just going to give me newtons. And the position can be determined by knowing that the equivalent point load will always travel through the centroid of the shape. So this is always going to be true uh, for any 2D problem like this. If I can find the centroid of the shape, uh, and there's a whole other uh, page and video lecture on finding centroids, uh, but if I can find that, it'll tell me what this XEQ value is. Um, so that's really the, uh, this is usually more simple for very simple shapes like a trapezoid. Uh, but if you've got something like parabolas, uh, it gets a little complicated to find um, the, <coughs> uh, the integrals, or sorry, the centroids there. So if I know the area, I know the centroid, I know I can figure out my magnitude and my position of my distributed force, or my equivalent point load. So if I have more complex shapes, I can use something called the parallel axis theorem, won't go too much into that here, uh, to find the centroid for those complex shapes. So now we're going to go into 3D surface force problems. Um, so this is a surface force that kind of varies over x and y. Uh, this is my example problem here. Uh, so I've got some circular area I'm interested in. 
Uh, and I've got a force that kind of goes it's zero in this corner and it goes up further. Um, so it varies. My force is equal to something times x plus something times y. So it varies with both x and y. And the first step in solving the integration is to find that force function. So describe the magnitude of the force and magnitude of the pressure with respect to x and y. So the <coughs> Now that we've moved and we have x and y, it's rather than the area under the curve, it's going to be the volume under the curve. So if I find the, if I integrate over the area, over this area this, of this circle here, uh, then I can find the, <coughs> find the volume uh, under that force function. And so if I, here I've got my uh, F, so force in terms of x and y, that's that 5x plus 10y over there. And I'm integrating with respect to the area. I don't have an area or an A variable in there. Uh, so really what integrating over the area means uh, is I'm going to take this step by step. So I have my f of x, of y, x and y. That's my 5x plus 10y. Uh, I'm going to integrate with respect to x. So I go from x min to x max. Uh, however far I go there, uh, dx. And then whatever I find there, I then integrate with respect to y. Uh, so when you're integrating with respect to x, x is your variable. This is a partial integral. Uh, so you treat x as the variable that is changing, and y you treat as constant. It's just some number, uh, and you treat it like any other number. Uh, when you integrate with respect to y, you're going to treat x as the constant, and y is your variable that you're integrating with respect to. Uh, so by doing this two-step process, uh, I can integrate over the area, uh, even though I don't have an A uh, in my equation that's relating force. So to find the point of application, we now have two dimensions. We have X and we have Y. So I need to find uh, two of these, and it's going to be very similar uh, to my equations from before. So F of X is Y times X. I'm going to integrate over the area, which means again I'm going to have to break it up. and I divide by FEQ, uh, and then for the Y, it's the same thing, so F of X of Y, that's my 5X plus 10Y, except this time we're going to multiply by Y uh, and integrate over the, with respect to the area. So again, I'll have to break it up into integrate with respect to X and then integrate with respect to Y. So as an alternative to this, uh, it's a lot of calculus when we go to 3D. Um, <coughs> we can use geometry again. So we can use composite parts. The magnitude of the equivalent point load will be equal to the volume under this force function. So we've got kind of this weird box with the slanted top. Uh, if I can find the volume under that curve, uh, then <coughs> that's going to be my magnitude of the equivalent point load. And the <coughs> equivalent point load will tra travel through the center of volume uh, it's going to basically be the center of mass uh, for a uniformly uh, a uniform density object. So if we find the center of mass of this body, that lets me uh, find x eq and y eq <coughs> because I know the equivalent point load will travel through that center of mass. Moving on to the last step in this whole thing, we can go one step further with body force problems integrating the force function with respect to uh, volume. <coughs> so I'm going to have my force in terms of x, y, and z. Integrate that with respect to volume. means do it at one at a time. So integrate with respect to x, then y, then z. So there's a lot of calculus here with this whole thing. And finding the three coordinates for the point of application. So again, we've gone up to three dimensions. Uh, and I'm going to have x, y, and z. And the only difference between these three is it's f of x, y, and z times x, times y, and then times z. Uh, and again, when you're integrating with respect to volume, you need to kind of break it up into x, then y, then z uh, with your actual uh, integrations. So one more thing to note here with body force problems, unfortunately, uh, we would go, rather than finding the volume, uh, we would jump to four dimensions. Since there's no kind of equivalent volume for four dimensions, 
Uh, the only way to really work with these body force problems is going to be to do the actual calculus. So with that, that's all I have for the equivalent point load. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again.